Welcome to episode 41 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this very special episode, Special Agents Greg Branch and Bill Tolan are interviewed about the qualifications and requirements needed to become a special agent with the FBI. Greg joined the FBI in 1995 and has been assigned to squads handling reactive matters such as drugs and bank robberies and to white-collar crime investigations. For the past seven years, Greg has been tasked with recruiting efforts and is the applicant coordinator responsible for managing the special agent hiring program in the Philadelphia Division. Bill Tolan is a recent graduate of the FBI Academy, and he is also based in the Philadelphia Division, where he is on a cyber squad. Both Greg and Bill provide a thorough and personal review of the FBI special agent hiring program and what it's like to train at the FBI Academy. I want to give a special shout out to SAC special agent in charge, Michael Harpster of the Philadelphia Division for allowing me to interview Greg and Bill. Thanks, Mike. This is an episode that I really, really wanted to do, not only because I had listeners asking for it. I'm talking to you, Sean, Ben and Jay but also because I spent three years of my FBI career as the applicant coordinator, encouraging and recruiting others to join the FBI. Another reason is because when I joined the FBI, I was one of only 24 black females in the Bureau. And right now, the numbers have increased a little, but black females still only make up 1% of the special agent workforce. And so I want to do my part in encouraging everyone to join the FBI, but especially women and minorities. And the FBI is currently having a major recruitment push to make that happen. The New York Times recently had an article, Where Are Women in the FBI's Top Ranks? that went through some of the issues that the FBI is facing diversity in the FBI, as in all law enforcement agencies, is crucial to the work that we do. I want to encourage you after you listen to this podcast to also listen to episode 14, where I interview special agent in charge, retired Wayne Davis, who was among the first African American fully qualified agents to join the FBI. It's a fascinating interview where he talks about diversity and why it's important. And he also talks about his own personal one-on-one meeting with Director Hoover. One last thing before we get to the interview. If this is your first time listening to FBI Retired Case File Review, I want to introduce myself. I'm a retired agent. I was in the Bureau from 1982 through 2008. When I retired and started working as the director of media relations of SEPTA, Philadelphia's public transportation agency, I left that position in November of 2015 in order to do this podcast and write books. My current book, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry is available at Amazon.com if you'd like to check that out. Now here's the show. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome my guest, Special Agent Greg Branch of the Philadelphia Division, Applicant Coordinator, and I guess you'd be called New Agent, Bill Tolan, also in the Philadelphia Division. And they are going to provide us with a lot of information about what it takes to be a Special Agent with the FBI now, and also take us through the application process and to what happens at the FBI Academy. So I'm very excited. So I want to welcome you both. Thanks, Jerry. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Jerry. Good to see you. All right. So we're going to start with Greg first and uh, have him take us through the whole application process. But before we do that, Greg, if you don't mind just giving us a little bit more information about you, you know, when you joined the FBI and some of the work that you did in the FBI as an agent before you took over the hiring program. So uh, I joined the FBI in 1995, and prior to that, I worked for uh, Toyota Motors Corporation. I worked in the car business as a, uh, as a sales rep for the factory. 
Before that, I was at a short stint in the military, and but basically came from corporate America. Like I said, I got to Philadelphia in 95, and I worked uh, reactive crimes. I worked uh, on the drug squad, squad two. And then I went over to the bank robbery squad and worked uh, with the violent crimes task force. I then went upstairs and had the honor of working with you, Jerry, up on squad nine. Worked white collar for a number of years and uh, had a really good time up there. Uh, had a very short stint on healthcare fraud, and then I uh, came over uh, as a division recruiter and then eventually uh, was given also the applicant coordinator responsibilities. So I've been doing this for the past seven years. And uh, you're specifically looking for people for the agent position? Specifically, yeah. I hire agents, although I also attract folks who want to get into the FBI as analysts and also other professional support positions. Uh, for the agents, we're looking for folks who have at least three years of work experience prior to joining the FBI, full-time professional work experience. It could be in just about any other discipline, but a really highly competitive applicant will be someone who has a background in accounting, finance, uh, computer science, engineering, any of the hard sciences, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, and uh, anyone with an intelligence background. Those are the most competitive applicants. They've got to be between 23 years of age and no older than 37 years of age at the time that they apply. If they're over 37 years of age and have prior military service, they can apply for a waiver of the, of the 37 year old age requirement. And in most cases, the Bureau will grant them that exception. Uh, you gave us a, a list of people that you're really interested in, people with backgrounds and uh, different college degrees and experience. Why those particular people? Well, the subjects that we go after now in the FBI, they've evolved and they've changed. So many of the subjects that we uh, pursue have advanced degrees. Uh, they speak multiple languages. Uh, they're engineers. They're scientists. They're computer uh, scientists. They're, they're experts in the areas of technology, making bombs. And they have very sophisticated methods to communicate to one another. So we're really looking for individuals that can kind of get into that world, so to speak, and work for us, the good guys. We're still taking people from some of the traditional disciplines uh, that the FBI has always looked for people in accounting. And we do take people with bachelor's degrees in social work, criminal justice, and the like, but just not as many as we did in the past because those applicants are not as competitive as the ones that I mentioned previously. The people that you did mention, what kind of work would they do when they came into the FBI? What are you looking to have their skills transfer into what type of investigations? They've got to really be able to go wherever that particular SAC wants them to go. We really want to be able to plug an agent into any squad where there's a need. So, for example, you may have a computer science background and one would think you would go naturally to a cyber squad. Or you might uh, have an electrical engineering degree and maybe go to a tech squad. But if asked, you might have to work drugs or you might be asked to go to a bank robbery squad or to work white collar. We try to utilize that skill set that we sought so desperately, for example, computer science, to go to a cyber squad to work on one of the CART teams. So uh, we really could, could you explain CART? So we have a regional uh, computer forensics lab, and when we go in for a search warrant and we see someone's computer, we have to have someone that can bring that computer back to the office and literally take it apart, the hard drive, uh, everything that's, uh, that that person has done on a computer, and we have to kind of retrace what they did. Um, so we, we have those folks who are called card examiners. All right, so why don't we go through the application process? First of all, how long is the process? So if somebody was interested in joining the FBI, on an average, how long would it take them before they were driving down to the uh, FBI Academy? Ordinarily, it takes on average between six and nine months. It used to take about a year, a little bit over a year, but if we have classes going through, normally it'll take anywhere from six to nine months. From the time they take phase one, which is the written test, to the time they walk down to the academy. Tell us what's the first step. If somebody is interested in becoming an FBI agent, what is the first step that you would suggest that they do? 
Okay, the first step is for them to go online and to go to our specific website. No USA Jobs, no other website other than www.fbijobs.gov. And that's where you'll find the application for the special agent position. And that's where you'll find uh, the application for any other professional support position. Professional support is any position in the FBI other than a special agent. But application is made there. From there... Uh, you will get another email back from the FBI directing you to schedule yourself for what's called a phase one test. And that test is given off-site uh, at a contractor's location. It's not an FBI site. And that site will be based upon whatever your zip code is. So we will identify the nearest testing center to where you live. And that's where you'll go to take the phase one test. The phase one test consists of logical reasoning, reading comprehension, and situational judgment uh, type questions. There is no math on the phase one test. They got rid of the math after I got in. Uh, from there, <clears throat> you would then, if you pass, and it's just a pass or fail, there's no minimum score that we're looking for, but it's just a pass or fail. You'll wait around, you'll get your results, and hopefully you've passed. You'll then get instructions from our office, the Philadelphia Division, if you're in this territory, to come in uh, for what's called a meet and greet session. That will. Let me just uh, interrupt for a second. And uh, this testing center uh, that uh, people can uh, go to take this phase one test, is that located in an FBI office or FBI facility? No, it's not. Uh, in many cases, it might be a retail store. It could be a phone store. It could be uh, any other small retail business. This business has usually contracted with the Department of Justice to be a testing site. So you'll go in, you'll report in, and they will take you to a designated room and administer the test. And it's an online test, but it is, it is not. No. In years past, it was at an FBI facility, but no longer. Then you find out right after you take the test whether you've passed or failed. And if you fail, what happens? Do you have another chance to take that test again? Uh, yes, Jerry. If you fail the test, you have to wait approximately one year, and then you can retest it a second time. You're only allowed one other test. So unfortunately, if you fail that second test, you're done. That's it. So passing that, uh, you would then come into the office for a meet and greet, and that's where you'd have a briefing with me for about an hour, and I would kind of explain the process going forward, everything from background checks to physical fitness testing, health screen testing. Is there one of you in every FBI office? I, there's 56 FBI offices. Is there somebody who's the applicant coordinator in charge of managing the agent hiring program in all of those offices? Yes, there's an applicant coordinator and an applicant recruiter in every field office. And in some offices, like in Philadelphia, it might be one person. So I, I serve in both capacities. But there's someone that you can call and in most cases hear from. The volume of calls is, is very great. So the person may not get right back to you, but someone should get back to you if you have any specific questions. And that's in all 56 field offices. You then come in, and after that briefing by the applicant coordinator or the recruiter, you have a breakout session with an agent, a one-on-one -on -one interview with that agent. And that agent is assessing whether or not they think you would be a good candidate for what's called phase two. Phase two is actually a two-part test, and that test uh, consists of an oral interview where you're asked 13 specific questions, and those questions are all about you, the applicant. Every applicant that comes in will get asked the same 13 questions, and that interview is approximately an hour long. In the afternoon, you'll have a written exercise, and that's where we give you a fraud scenario. It could be a terrorism scenario. We ask you to read it and write a convincing argument about what you just read to your supervisor, and that writing sample is scored uh, by the agents as well as the interview. What are you looking for? when you score that written exercise? Uh, we're really looking to see if they can pull out all the relevant and pertinent information in that writing sample. We're looking at writing style. We're looking at grammatical uh, writing. So, you know, we're literally looking to see if you dot the I's and cross the T's, uh, sentence structure, tense structure, 
uh, making sure that you're a pretty good writer. Because as you know, Jerry, we do an awful lot of writing in the FBI. We do. That's something that they don't depict on television. We write, we, we write a lot of reports and they have to be, uh, they have to be very, uh, professionally written because these are documents that show up in court. So this meet and greet and then the 101 and then the uh, written test are all on the same day? Uh, No, the meet and greet would take place on a separate day. And then we send everyone's packet or application on that write up, the assessment from that agent. We send that down to FBI headquarters and then they make a determination as to who the competitive applicants are. At the end of that meet and greet, there are three different categories of folks that we send down. You have most competitive, uh, competitive, and then least competitive. And really the only two groups that FBI headquarters is considering are uh, most competitive and competitive. And what's that based on? That's based on a person's work history. That's based on their degree. uh, That's based on uh, their oral communication skills, uh, professional appearance, demeanor, questions that they might ask, interests outside of their work, volunteer service that they may be involved in, criminal history. No one can really proceed through this process if they have a felony because Congress will not allow the Bureau to grant a top secret security clearance to anyone that has a felony. So it's a total package of what that agent hears in that meet and greet session that makes a person competitive or non-competitive. So even though it has a fun name, meet and greet, this really should be taken seriously as an interview, an opportunity to shine, to show your best. Absolutely. Uh, we ask the applicant, applicant to come in professionally dressed with a resume and also, and one other thing I didn't mention that we look at is their physical fitness self-assessment. We're going to ask each applicant to take our, administer the PFT, the physical fitness test to themselves, where they have to score a minimum of 12 points. That's the minimum passing score in the four, or I'm sorry, five exercises that they have to take. Uh, sit-ups, push-ups, a 300 meter sprint, and a mile and a half run. So a person has to be competitive in all areas of that test uh, in order to move forward. Now, since this is a self-assessment, I mean, is it a possibility that someone could say they can do so many push-ups or they can run, you know, that mile and a half in a certain time and not be telling the truth? Yes. You sound like you know the program, and I know you do. (laughs) There are people who are less than candid let's say, on their applications and say that they are are passing the test. In many cases, they may not, in some cases, they may not administer the test and just think, hey, I know I could pass that. I'm just, I'm not going to go out and do it. But they really get measured or it's tested when they come back after phase two, because after they come back from phase two, we give them that test within a two week period. We administer a polygraph test and a fit test. So if they haven't taken it and they're not passing it, We will find out. If they get less than a 12, of course, they fail it. But if they get less than a 5, they can't take that test with us for another year. So we require that they wait a year before they come back. So it's very important that when you ask them to do this self-assessment on their physical fitness, that they tell the truth. It's very important that they tell the truth because they're really only hurting themselves. They kind of push themselves back in the process. If you're getting below a five, we're not going to start your background, which would be the next step after you pass the fit test. If you get uh, below a 12, then you have 30 to 60 days within which to take the next PT test. If you fail that one, you get one more shot. And if you fail that, then you're out uh, permanently. You're out of the process. Now, you had mentioned to me that uh, some applicants are actually applying to be a member of the hostage rescue team and that they need additional points for this physical fitness test? Yeah, the hostage rescue team applicants, those are usually folks who come from backgrounds in either uh, law enforcement from, say, a local or state SWAT team or even another federal agency, or their special forces in the United States military. All those applicants have to be approved by the HRT unit once they make application. But on their fit test, uh, the pull-ups, which is the final exam, final test of the PT test, uh, they have to be able to demonstrate that they can do them, and they have, have to reach a minimum score of 20 to proceed as an HRT candidate. So a regular candidate is a 12, 
HRT is a 20. Uh, and just because they're applying under the HRT umbrella does not mean they're automatically on the HRT team. They still have to, once they're off probation as an agent, they're just afforded an automatic tryout for the HRT team. They still have to make the team. I want to go back to that meet and greet because you had mentioned to me, we, we uh, spoke briefly before this, that there were a number of things that, a number of things that you went over with the applicants at that meet and greet, such as uh, salary requirements and transfers and things like that. So I'd like for us to talk about that too. Okay, uh, the transfer policy, one of the things that I go over is the transfer policy. So if an applicant comes in and they want this job, the, one of the first things I tell them is they are going to have to relocate. They will not, more than likely, not come back to the Philadelphia division. It's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely. The Bureau's policy is that they really don't want to send you back anywhere that you have either lived or worked. So generally, in most cases, you're going to be re- reassigned to, to one of the other 55 field offices throughout the United States. The other thing that I go over quite extensively is the drug policy. And the drug policy is probably the most common disqualifier for an applicant as they go through the process. The current drug policy is as follows. You could not have used marijuana within the past three years at the time that you apply. You couldn't have used a harder drug like cocaine, LSD, steroids, within the past 10 years at the time that you apply. If you fall outside the drug guidelines, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't apply. It just means that you can't apply until you are within our drug guidelines. And this requires total candor because if you still try to go through the process and are less than candid when you get to the polygraph and you fail it, you'll be permanently disqualified from ever applying in the future because you will have failed a FBI polygraph. And has that happened? Have you had really good candidates who lied and were caught at the polygraph stage? Absolutely. It happens uh, quite frequently, unfortunately. And the applicant is really doing it to themselves because we tell them from the door that we're not judging them. We realize that there are people who have experimented with illegal drugs at one time or another. You could have taken, for example, back in college, you could have tried marijuana 15 times. But if it was three over three years ago, it's inconsequential as it relates to the process. But if you tried it one time within the past two years, then you're going to be disqualified. So it's better just to be honest and to wait until you can come in and definitively say that I have not taken marijuana within the past three years and then move on throughout the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I hope people uh, listen to what you're saying. Let's talk about salary. Salary, uh, everyone usually wants to talk about it. Uh, starting salary for a new agent, again, depending on where we send you, because there's a cost of living adjustment and uh, there's an overtime, which is 25% of whatever your base salary is. So the starting salary is between sixty-one and $71,000. Uh, and then within five years, By that time, you're what's called a GS-13, so you're at that journeyman's grade. You're becoming almost a senior agent, if you will. Uh, You're making between $98,000 and $113,000 a year. Oh, that's pretty competitive as far as other corporations and businesses out there. There's very few that can probably guarantee that you're going to be making $100,000 or over $100,000 within five years. Yeah, it's very competitive. Uh, Again, assuming that you're doing a good job and you're receiving good, what we call PARs, performance appraisal ratings, you will continue to get grade increases, step increases, things like that. So it is very competitive. Uh, We have a very competitive retirement package. You can retire at 57, which is our mandatory retirement age, or before, as long as you have at least 20 years of service as an agent and you have reached at least 50 years of age. So you're still young enough to get out and start another career, just like you did at SEPTA. So, and that's something that many, many agents do. Uh, they are able to have very successful second careers using the FBI as a springboard into a, to another good career. All right, so you've had your meet and greet, and um, you have been rated as competitive or most competitive. What's next? Okay, so if you've been rated most competitive or competitive, you'd then be afforded an interview or a phase two session, which consists of an interview and a writing sample exercise. So the interview 
uh, is where we ask each and every applicant 13 standard questions. All 13 questions are about the applicant. There are no trick questions about the FBI, our budget, who our director was in a particular year. All the questions deal with the applicant. And I take it you're not going to give us a clue as to what those questions are? You are correct. I cannot do that. But they are, they are questions that uh, most people who are applying to the FBI, FBI would expect. Uh, and the questions, uh, again, are related to the individual. So we're not really asking you uh, anything about something unusual to you. We're asking you about yourself. So that interview takes approximately an hour. Uh, and in most cases, that's more than enough time the applicant finishes within that hour. In the afternoon, there's a writing sample that's given. So you might be given, for example, either a fraud scenario or a terrorism scenario. We ask you to read it, and then we ask you to write about it. And we're looking to see if you can pull out all the relevant information within that writing sample. Uh, you're given 90 minutes to do that, uh, and we are basically also looking at your uh, grammatical uh, structure of the paragraphs of, of the essay. We're looking at the opening, the body of what you wrote, and the closing. How convincing of an argument are you making to the reader? Both the interview and the writing sample are scored by the agents on site within 15 minutes after you leave the room, and it's a simple pass or fail. So at the end of that phase two session, that entire day, and this phase two does take the better part of a day, uh, we know whether that person has passed or failed. Again, there's no minimum score. And where does this phase two session take place? And actually, who's involved? So uh, if you're applying in our office through the Philadelphia division, we are mandated to send our applicants to New York City. That's the nearest phase two testing site. But we have testing sites throughout the country. And we're doing so many phase two testing sites this year that we will actually even send Philadelphia people to the, the, uh, the most available, if you will, testing site. Sometimes New York might be uh, uh, full, so we would fly you to another city like Chicago or to Miami to uh, take your phase two test just to kind of get you through the process. Who takes part in the phase two assessments? It's a panel of three agents, and they're also flown in from around the country so that the chance or the likelihood of them knowing you or knowing the applicant are pretty slim. We want to keep it as objective as possible. Uh, so the panel of three will interview you, and then there would be three separate agents who would actually judge your writing sample. So the same agents that interview you are not the same agents that would look at your writing sample. What we really look at is your work experience and that interview and that writing sample. That's really the meat of what gets you moved on to the next to the next phase. If I can't move through that process of the interview and the testing, nobody uh, is going to be able to recommend me into the agent position. No. They may write a letter of recommendation, but if, for example, you have failed the PT test, you're not working out, and you can't pass it, you can't pass the mile and a half run and meet our time, or do the required number of sit-ups, then, yeah, you're going to have a problem. And no matter what they've written or who you know, uh, it's not going to help you move on. So there is a certain amount of uh, personal accountability through the process that the applicant is responsible for. Recommendations are great, but you've got to be able to demonstrate that you can do the tasks that we put before you. Is there any other part of Phase 2, or are we... If you do well in that phase two, are you moving now to a phase three? Yes. If you pass phase two, you then come back to Philadelphia. Again, you're assuming you're applying through here. And then the next step would be the polygraph test. So we administer a polygraph test or a lie detector test, as many people know it. And that basically just measures the veracity of what you have on your application, the truthfulness on your application. Are you who you say you are? Um, and we ask you things about your allegiance and loyalty to the United States. We ask you about drug usage. Uh, we ask you several other questions. All of those questions that we're going to ask you, the polygrapher will sit down and talk to you about those questions before we hook you up to the machine. And as we tell all of our applicants, the best way to pass the polygraph test is to just be honest and tell the truth. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, for most people, and we understand that it's uncomfortable for us. You know, no one really likes to take one, 
But the one way to get around it is to just be honest and uh, tell the truth. After the polygraph test, you pass that. We then administer the uh, fit test. So that goes back to your original question. If, if someone's lying, we're going we're gonna to catch it at the fit test. So we administer that test, and it's in a particular order. Uh, sit-ups, 300-meter sprint, mile-and-a-half run. I'm sorry, sit-ups, 300-meter sprint, push-ups, and the mile-and-a-half run, and then the pull-ups with a five-minute rest in between each event. You've got a, to get a minimum score of 12, but you've got to score at least one point in each event to pass. And as I said earlier, HRT candidate has to get a 20. A uh, normal candidate or a non-HRT candidate has to get at least a 12. Now, is there some place that um, applicants or people interested in knowing what this score entails, is there some place that they can find what uh, you're looking for? Yes. When they initially go online to apply, the application process will take you directly to the fit test and it will require that you view it and look at it so that you see from the beginning what you're going to be required to do. So there's no way they've moved on and applied and not seen the fit test. Also, at the meet and greet, I cover that extensively, that they're going to have to take that fit test. And they'll have to take it at least twice throughout the process, once in the beginning and one 60 days before they go to Quantico. Now, is this an area, and I, I'm asking this question with knowing a little bit what the answer is, uh, because you said at the beginning that you're looking for people that are have a science or technical base, and I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, presumptuous, but people who are interested in sciences and computer sciences um, are not necessarily the people that are out there running and doing physical fitness. I mean, that's always the, the jock, the people that used to apply for the agent position all the time, police officers and military people. So what do you say to somebody with a technical experience, you know, working on computers and not necessarily in the best physical condition that they can be? Well, uh, two things I would say. If they're not in the best physical condition and are not really into maybe trying to reach that point, there is still a place for you in the FBI. So a person with a computer science background could also apply to be a computer scientist. We have support employees where we have folks who are, they work for us as computer scientists and they are not agents, although they investigate cases and assist agents in those cases. To the technical person that does want to be an agent, the test and the standards that they have to hit are very reasonable. They're, we're not uh, we're not looking for someone to be as fast as Hussein Bolt in the 300 meters or to run a world record in the mile. Uh, the times and the scoring for the times is reasonable. And with consistent, regular, somewhat intense training, you should be able to reach all of those goals and objectives of the of the training that we require. But you have to start it early, and that's why we have you view that video at the onset of the application process so you know from the beginning what's going to be required. What some people unfortunately do is they may wait until to see if they've been selected for phase two, which is, you know, they're almost three quarters through the program, and then they start training. Or they think, that since they were athletic in college or go to the gym on a regular basis, that they can pass this test. So it's not a difficult test, but you do have to train for it because of, there's a very little rest in between events. So it's a, uh, an accumulation of events in a short period of time. And uh, so you've got to be training for that, training with very little rest in between. But it's attainable. All right, so you've had the polygraph and the PT test, and you've passed both. What happens next? Okay, so once you reach that, reach that point, we then give you a conditional offer. Hey, we're going to hire you pending the outcome of the rest of the process. The rest of the process is just a couple more steps. There's a security interview, which takes place in our office. There's a physical health screening test, just to make sure that you're healthy enough to go through the rigors of being a special agent and going through the academy. Uh, your background investigation starts. Uh, we go to former employers. We go to neighborhoods that you've lived in. We talk to friends and relatives and professional acquaintances. There's a drug test, uh, urine analysis. So there are about four or five other hoops that you have to jump through until you get through the end of the process. 
after all that's done, if you pass all that, we then give you a uh, an appointment letter, which says, hey, congratulations, you've been selected to start the FBI Academy on X date, and your training will consist of the following, and that's uh, the 20 weeks at Quantico. So at that point, it's my job and uh, my counterpart, Lucy Troyes, to get you into the next available FBI class. All of that takes approximately nine, no more than 10 months, uh, as long as we're having classes go through regularly, which uh, we anticipate having uh, throughout 2017. So from the time you went online and applied until you finish, let's say, the, the, uh, the physical and your security interview, all of that takes about nine to 10 months. And then you're ready to go. We're at that point, we're making phone calls and we're in constant, constant communication with you. We're going to tell you, Hey, we're about to go to your present employer just to notify them that you're going to be leaving. We're going to be hiring you. And we're kind of giving you some time to prepare to leave, getting your apartment or your house in order, you know, setting things up with your spouse or your significant other. Hey, you're going to be gone for 20 weeks. Uh, we don't just throw it on you at the very end. Sometimes we do. Uh, we try not to. But we want you to know where you're going so you can make a smooth transition and do well at the academy. Now, you mentioned spouse and partner, and I know you talked about the transfer policy, and you were telling me about an interview that you do to make sure that they understand what uh, could be in the future also. Yes, um, we're required to talk to the uh, partners of all applicants to let them know about the fact that the applicant's going to be carrying a firearm. The applicant may be involved in a deadly force uh, situation. The applicant's going to be required at times to work longer hours than normal. The applicant could be subject to uh, transfers at any time because all applicants, all applicants sign a mobility agreement. Uh, you serve uh, the FBI and you serve uh, the needs of the FBI. So one little phrase that we all use as a person goes through this pro process is the needs of the FBI come first. So uh, if we needed you to go to another office to work permanently, you would be subject to a transfer. Now, in the real world, that doesn't happen too often, but it could happen. Uh, we need to tell folks about collateral duties that are available that their uh, partner may want to become involved in. Uh, things like undercover assignments, which are all voluntary, but these are things that some people become involved in. We also tell them about uh, suitability requirements. The spouse or the partner cannot be involved in any illegal activity. So you're married or you live with an FBI agent and you use illegal drugs on a regular basis. That can't happen. That person, that applicant would, would eventually lose their jobs. Uh, we have to check and do background checks on anyone that the applicant is living with. So um, you may be single, decide you want to live with your partner, well, we would need to know who your partner is and run a criminal background check on that, again, because we have suitability requirements. Um, so these are things that we talk to the applicant about and we talk to their, 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 their better half about. And occasionally, yeah, there are problems and people have to withdraw or sometimes the other uh, partner will come in and hear some of these things and they, they withdraw the applicant. So it depends on how it happens. I think you were telling me about an instance where the applicant was all ready to pack the bags and go to Quantico, and then the spouse decided they did not want to have to move out of the uh, out of the area. Yeah, um, people get very comfortable in a particular area. Sometimes the the partner has a great job or has a, a really promising career, and it's a career that only they can perform here in Philadelphia. Um, and if they moved to another city, they'd have to either start over or they couldn't do what it is they do there. So uh, they cancel everything. Um, and sometimes the applicant, we find, has not been totally forthright with the partner in uh, telling them that, hey, there's a possibility that we're going to move, when in fact, it's a very strong possibility that they're going to have to move. So it's my job to make sure that they're aware of that so that the interests of the FBI are protected uh, because the process itself costs the Bureau a lot of money.
you know, by the time an applicant gets down to the academy, it's close to $50,000 that we have invested in them between backgrounds, polygraphs, physical uh, health screening tests, things like that. So we have spent money to get them there in that seat. So we want to make sure that everyone goes, everyone who goes stays. So it's a it's kind of where I earn my money, where I have to be a good judge of character and make sure that the person is mature enough and being honest with me and with their, their partners as they go through the process. All right. So we're at the step where the applicant is going to be going to the FBI Academy. And so we're get ready to, to, to speak with Bill. But before we do, I just want to sum up, I want to give people an idea how many uh, applicants the FBI has and how many positions for the FBI special agent position there are. Well, it varies from year to year. Um, we, on an a- in an average year, when we're in a regular hiring mode, generally we will hire between six and 700 agents a year. And the reason for that is every year, as you know, we have a mandatory retirement age of 57. Now, currently, uh, our current director, Director Comey, has said to onboard agents that he will extend them from age 57 till age 60 on a year-to-year basis. So we do have some agents who have taken advantage of that and who will take advantage of that in the future. But we're still getting uh, relatively uh, long in the tooth, if you will. So we're recruiting we're recruiting a lot more people. And so uh, on average, nationally, I think the worst year, when I say the worst, the most uh, applicants that I've seen is we had nationally about 60,000 applicants for about 700 jobs as, as agents. Uh, now, we're also hiring other uh, professional positions, intelligence analysts, staff operations specialists, linguists, secretaries, FBI police. So there are other jobs that we have. But, you know, I'm specifically talking about the agent position. Very good. So I think this next part people are going to be as equally interested in because some of them have seen the show Quantico and uh, they would love to know if, uh, if it's real and, uh, you know, how much of it's true and what actually happens at the FBI Academy. And so I'm very happy to reintroduce uh, our other guest here, and that's Bill Tolan. Hi, Bill. How you doing, Jerry? Thanks for having me. You are a recent graduate of the FBI Academy. That's correct. I graduated within the last year from the FBI Academy in Quantico. Basically, the FBI Academy, it's a 20-week uh, training. Uh, it's located in Quantico, Virginia, just off of I-95, about a half hour south of Washington, D.C. Start off, you go down there, you report on a Sunday night. Uh, you fill out some paperwork that, that evening. I think we had to get there around 4 o'clock or so. Fill out some paperwork for our benefits and that kind of stuff. And then the very next day is when you start what's called the ONE program. The ONE program is not just for FBI agents. It's actually a nationwide gathering of new professional professional staff employees and FBI agents. Bill, before we get into uh, the information about the FBI Academy, I'd like to learn a little bit about you, when you became an FBI agent, and why you were interested in the agent position. So I've always wanted to be an FBI agent ever since I was a little kid. Um, I started my career with the Bureau in 2010 as a professional staff employee. Um, I started off in closed files up in New York City and worked my way up the totem pole, uh, doing some surveillance for for the support side of the house. Then I became an analyst. And then from there, I went on and got got scheduled for a class date for the FBI Academy as a special agent with the FBI. Let me ask you how old you were when you came in. And also, what did you major in in college? I majored in criminal justice at Westchester University here in Pennsylvania. When I started, I was around 25. And again, that was a professional support worked about four years on the support side of the house before becoming an agent. So by the time you became an agent, you were in that age range that we keep talking about, uh, 27 to 31, with most of the people going to the FBI Academy being 29 years old. That's correct. I was 29 and turned 30 while I was down there. So yeah, so I, you know, it's, it's the prime age for people becoming agents. Typically, it's from you know, 27 to 31. 
But we had people in our class that were 37 and they had the uh, the waiver filled out because they came from the military. I think we had about two or three of them in our class. You know, it was a good a good mix of military personnel, accountants, people with foreign language abilities, um, you know, all various types of backgrounds were in my class. It's really fascinating to see. Could you give me an idea? I don't need any names, but if you give me, if you could give me an idea of the other people in your class, uh, where they, uh, where they came from, what they were doing, um, and their background before they became agents. So we can get an idea of, of the type of person that's coming into the FBI today. Sure. We had, we had various, uh, positions. We had people who were in the FBI prior, like myself, I want to say maybe about 15 to 20% of the class was filled with professional support that came over to the, to the, uh, agent side of the house, we had lawyers, accountants, people who spoke foreign languages. We had a gym teacher. We had all kinds of professions that uh, that started off and then decided to, to switch careers and, and join the FBI. How many people were in the class? Uh, my class, there was 49 of us. Um, we had two people recycled because they got concussions during our training, during one of the DT sessions. And unfortunately, we had, had one that didn't pass the, uh, the training with the rest of us. Now, I know you were telling me that the class, right after your class, everything changed, you know, as far as the makeup of, of the, the class. Could you tell me more about that? So the class I was in was the very last class of what they call the old version of the FBI agent classes. Um, and that was all FBI agents, where now the class after mine was the very first class of the classes combined between FBI agents and intelligence analysts. And the reasoning behind this is because we work hand in hand with these analysts every day on our squads. So they want us going through the same training so that we all are on the same page with, you know, intelligence and just so each other know what we're doing on a day to day basis. So when it comes to things like physical fitness and firearms, how does that work? So as of right now, when I was down there, they were they were in class together, the, the intelligence analysts and the agents, for the first 10 weeks. And then after the 10th week, the intelligence analysts would graduate and they would uh, go on to their, their field offices that there was, were given. And the agents would stay for the remaining 10 weeks. And the remaining 10 weeks for the agents, they would, they would have heavy focus on firearms training, defensive tactics physical fitness, and all things that the agents have to go through on a day-to-day basis. And tell us more about the academic part, because I take it that's what the analysts and the agents are doing together. Just briefly, tell us a little bit about the topics covered and what uh, is required as far as testing. Yeah, so there's a variety of uh, different trainings we go through academically. Um, you know, we have legal classes. We have classes on deadly force policy, interviewing techniques. We have we even have a class on um, tactical driving while we're down there, so we know how to you know defend like high speed pursuits and that kind of stuff. Training in surveillance and the core values of the FBI, the history of the FBI. We 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 study different cases that the FBI has been involved with throughout the history of the FBI. Um, there's just there's various things that we cover. And it's important to get it, get the right training with both IAs and agents so that we're all on the same page when we get to the field office. And how difficult is it? I mean, do people fail? Do they fail out? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few people who fail out. Um, it's very rigorous. You have to spend a lot of hours studying. W- when I got there, fortunately, I'm from the Philadelphia area, so I was able to come home on the weekends. But that being said, I knew I had to, to focus really hard on the academics during the week. So I would be down there. I'd study probably until about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, go to bed, wake up the next morning at about five, go to the gym, go get breakfast at the cafeteria, and then go on to my classes with all my other classmates. That sounds like a very vigorous training program. And tell us a little bit more about the academy. I mean, are you living on campus? Um it depends what class you're on. Uh, my my class, we were fortunate to stay on base, but the FBI Academy is undergoing re- renovations right now at their dormitories. They're working on them one dormitory at a time, but when we were there, one of the dorms was under renovations. 
We fortunately were in a different dorm, but the class after us had to stay at a hotel off base, which, you know, it's kind of frustrating for them because they had to get up extra early. They had to take a shuttle bus to get to, um, to the academy and, you know, get their workout in and they didn't have any place to store their clothes and they had various issues that they ran into, but, you know, we're all on the same team. So, you know, we would allow other classes to store their stuff in our dormitory rooms just so they could keep things on base. We've heard a little bit about the academic program. What what else are you learning at the FBI Academy? Well, we go through tactical training unit, which is I'm sure you guys have seen on TV, the Hogan's Alley stuff. You go through certain situations and scenarios just to, to prime you for what you may see in the real world. And they want to see how, how you react to certain situations and, you know, if, if you don't do as they think you should, they'll fix the problem and have you do the scenario again so that, so that you learn from it. And after you're done the scenarios, they spend time going over each scenario, how you reacted, why you reacted that way, and if it was right or wrong or indifferent. You know, there's, not, there's, there's more than one solution for every problem. So um, we would talk about why you did what you did and why somebody else did what they did. Not saying that one was wrong, but just the different approaches that you can take to resolve the problems. And what about firearms training? Could you tell us a little bit more about the training and what type of weapons that uh, you are trained in? So leaving the FBI Academy, my classmates and I were issued a Glock 22, which is a 40 caliber handgun. We were all issued one, but From what we're told, we are going to be switching over to a 9 millimeter. Before you went to the FBI Academy, had you ever fired a gun or carried a firearm before? How did you find that training, and what other weapons were you trained in? I had fired a gun uh, previously because I've hunted in the past, and we had a mountain house. So I was a little bit familiar with weapons. Uh, I wouldn't say I was a weapons expert by any means. I would say about 50% of my class had never fired a gun before in their lives. And the firearms instructors actually prefer that because a lot of people who do shoot, shoot weapons develop bad habits. And the firearms instructors have to break that down and build you back up again for how they want you to fire the weapon. So they prefer somebody who hasn't shot a gun so that they can teach you from the get-go how to fire your weapon, how to handle your weapon, all the different techniques you use and, and why you hold at certain positions. It's, it's just much easier for them to teach somebody who doesn't have any knowledge of it rather than somebody who's already developed bad habits. And I know there's a point in the, the training where you have to qualify and it's a very, you know, a heart thumping uh, day because everyone has to shoot the weapons and get a qualifying score. And if they don't, uh, well, you can tell us what happens. That's correct. Yeah, we have a a pistol qualification, and we have a qualification for our M4 and shotgun. All of them, they're pretty rigorous, but with all of the training you do ahead of time, they prepare you for it. You shoot the pistol qual and the the, uh, rifle qual and the shotgun qual many, many, many times before you actually take the real qual, which by the time you get to it, you know, it, it, it's no big deal. Um, my class, we didn't have anybody that, that fouled it. So nobody was really, I mean, it's stressful because it's a great test, but at the same point, we've been firing tons of ammunition. And by that point, you're all so familiar with how your weapon fires and what you need to do. So it wasn't an issue, but it is true. If you don't pass that, you're not allowed to carry a gun and you will be disqualified. But fortunately, we didn't have anybody have that issue when we were down there in my class. And the third area of training, of course, is the physical fitness. And I understand that now if you take the physical fitness test and you pass it, you don't have to continue taking that test throughout the training? From my understanding, uh, with the new class, yes, you, you take it within your first you know, week or two. And if you don't pass it, you get one extra shot later on through the training. You know, I think it's maybe week eight or nine or something like that um, if you don't pass the one in the first couple weeks. When you get down there, I cannot emphasize, I can't emphasize anymore how important it is to be physically fit by the time you get there. You're you're already going to know what the test is. You're going to run it on your own over and over and over again because you want to perfect it. You don't want to have 
any mistakes while you're out there because you don't want to risk that chance of failing. And I want to say during the applicant process, I probably took the uh, physical fitness test maybe three or four times with the instructors. And that means, you know, with it graded by the applicant coordinator, Greg, who's sitting right next to me. Fortunately, I did well, so I passed all of them. But even still, when I was getting ready to train, I went out and I would have my wife have a stopwatch and I'd run the 300 meter sprint. I'd run the mile and a half. Just, I wanted to make sure that I'd, I'd get over the uh, hump with no problem. And, you know, it paid off. So if I had any uh, recommendation, it would be to be as physically fit as possible by the time you get down there because you don't want to, you don't want to be the one who doesn't pass that, that first PT test. Just a few more questions. I, I really want to get an understanding of how difficult you found or even you can even answer for other people in your class you found the fbi academy and if you could describe it is it is it like college is it like basic training um how would you describe the fbi academy training i can't really say that it's like any other um i wasn't in the military i obviously went to college um you know it, if i had to pick it'd be a mix of the two um, you go to classes every day. You have to be there. You know, you're not taking any sick leave. You can't take any vacation days while you're there. In between classes, you're constantly running. You're running from one class to the next. And when I was there, I started in July. So I was there during the dead of the summer. So it was hot. And I think I lost about 15 pounds when I was down there. So it was hot and it was tough. You know, you're hitting the books late at night. You're getting up early in the morning to work out because you want to be physically fit. And then, you know, all day you're studying and doing PT and you're doing firearms and defensive tactics. There's just, there's a variety of things you're doing each and every day. And, you know, when you get down there, they'll have a schedule laid out for you so you'll know what to expect and when each class is coming up. So you can be a little prepared for it, but it is a very rigorous training. Like I said, it's kind of like college because you're studying all the time. You know, the tests are hard. And unlike college, if, if you don't pass two of the tests, then you're packing your bags and going home and you no longer have a job with the FBI, which, you know, you don't want to get to that point. So you do everything in your power to, to learn everything they're throwing at you. All right. So obviously you had no issues at the academy and uh, you were transferred to the Philadelphia office just briefly. And I know you've been working as an agent now for uh, 10 months, and you also worked for the FBI beforehand. But um, is it everything you thought it would be? It's awesome. Every day, you don't know what to expect with, uh, you know, things going on in my squad, my own cases. And the more interesting thing is going out and helping other squads. Um, what, what squad are you on right now? Right now, I'm on a cyber squad. So I'm doing cyber um, investigations, criminal intrusion, all that kind of uh that kind of uh, criminal activity. But I get calls all the time asking for help. They need extra bodies helping out on search warrants, arrest warrants, doing surveillance. Uh, It it just, it's unpredictable. And it's, it's like no other job. It's, it's awesome. We've talked about the application process. We've talked about the FBI Academy. I know that we had one special question that we have not touched on. And this question uh, I received from Jay uh, Lugo. And it was about uh, working as a uh, pilot for the FBI. And so, Greg, we want to answer uh, uh, Jay's uh, question. Sure. Um, I think his question was, What's the minimum number of hours that you would need in order to be qualified to fly uh, as an agent uh, pilot with us? And uh, I, I discovered that you really don't, there's no minimum number of hours. You just have to have a private pilot's license and what's something called a second class medical. So you have to have both of those things. Uh, he also wanted to know if we f- uh, flew fixed wing or rotary wing. And we actually fly both. On the fixed side, we fly... Uh, training vehicle planes, Gulfstream 5s, and on helicopters, we fly uh, A-Stars, 4D7s, and Blackhawks. Um, we have a desperate need for pilots, and the Bureau is actually uh, in such a great need for pilots that uh, when I talked to a fellow agent who is a pilot, he just came back from some training, the national training that they all go to, and they said that if an agent on board just has an interest in flying, 
and an aptitude to get a pilot's license, the Bureau will actually pay to send that person to flight school. So we're just not, we're not getting enough pilots in through our normal recruiting process. So we're, they haven't gone to that yet, but they're talking about it. Are there any other specialties that the FBI is looking for right now? Uh, language, uh, and one of the big languages that we're in great need of is Haitian Creole. And we're always, you know, very desperately looking for computer science majors uh, who can get through our entire process. But those would be uh, some real, some gaping holes that we have right now. Uh, Haitian Creole, but we will also give you credit for any language that you speak, even if it's not one of our listed critical languages. Go to our website, you'll see those languages. But you may speak a very selective and very uh, uh, a little known language. As long as you can pass our language test, we'll give you credit for that language. And that gets you into the process because you're a linguist. Or you can be an agent who has a linguist ability. All right. So somebody has just finished listening to this podcast episode, and they are very, very interested. What do they do now? Okay. They should, if they're interested in applying uh, and starting the process as a special agent or professional support, you must, and I can't emphasize enough, you must start the process online at fbijobs.gov. If they have a, a specific question or something that I didn't cover uh, in, in, our, in our question and answer period here, then they are uh, more than welcome to call me directly. So that's very kind of you to offer that. But um, uh, there are also uh, a Greg branch in our other 56 offices. So how would they find out how to contact your counterparts? Well, first of all, I forgot how extensive your audience was, Jerry. I mean, you've just blown up since you left SEPTA and the FBI. So they could call any number, any one of the field offices in all 56 offices here in the United States. We have an office in every major city, uh, and you can just ask for the applicant unit and ask for either the recruiter or the applicant coordinator. Generally, if you get the applicant unit, someone in that unit will transfer you to the right person. And every office has that. So um, that that's where I would go. Excellent. And I know that the FBI website, not just the FBI jobs, but just the FBI website also has lots and lots of information about the agent position and what agents do. And of course, you can continue to listen to FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams to learn about some of the very special and high profile cases that the FBI has worked throughout the years. So I want to again, thank you. Special Agent Greg Branch and Special Agent Bill Tolan for being with us today. You have answered a lot of questions that people have about the agent position, and you've made it less mysterious. And I hope that we have people that are going to be turning off this podcast, taking off their earbuds and going to their computer and filling out that application on uh, FBIjobs.gov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, I have a photo of Greg, Bill, and I, and links to websites and newspaper articles about joining the FBI and the need for diversity. If you enjoyed the episode, especially if you know people that might be interested in joining the FBI, I want to encourage you to share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes, I have all the social media share buttons. I also want to say that I support Director Comey. I support all of the agents in the FBI. I hope the FBI, which stands for Fidelity, Bravery, and Integrity, can continue to rise above today's political climate and continue to do the great work that we have always done. I also want to tell you about a FBI G-Man 2017 calendar that I will be giving away for free the PDF file copy starting next week. The calendar is full of images of FBI toys, games, and collectibles collected by retired agents Doug Hess, and Joe McQuillan, who will be interviewed in upcoming episodes of FBI Retired Case File Review. 
We initially put this calendar together back in 2008 when the FBI was celebrating their 100th anniversary. And with Doug Hess and Joe McQuillan's permission, I dusted the calendar off and updated it to 2017. And again, we'll be giving the PDF file copy away for free. So if you're interested, then go to my website after November 5th to download a copy. And one last thing, if you're looking for a crime novel about the FBI, and you want something a little different, something beyond the FBI chasing terrorists and serial killers, please check out my crime novel, Pay to Play, a story of corruption, temptation, and redemption. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.